Sage Wanderer here, coming at you from my shotgun shack in the Texas Outback. So, um, I don't know, I was just thinking about my time as a youth pastor, my time in ministry. And, um, you know, I met some good people who were involved in ministry and church management uh, during my career. Um, but mostly, I met people of varying degrees of corruption. And so many of my idols, you know, the that's a good word, <laughs> people that I really looked up to as ministers, let me down, mainly by how they treated others, and sometimes by because of how they treated me. But one person in particular treated me so poorly and so destroyed my, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, my faith in ministers, that it actually soiled my opinion of, of everyone who engages in a certain type of weird kind of manifestation and ministry uh, called the uh, sp spontaneous or spiritual laughter. That, that, that this person that treated me poorly was his, uh, that was his M.O. His M.O. method of operation was to, uh, at the end of his sermon, he'd take the microphone and he'd put it in people's faces and they would start giggling and other people would think it was funny and they would laugh and pretty soon people would just start laughing for no reason and as he went around passing the microphone around, this like spirit of laughter would spread and everybody would just roll around on the ground and laugh and laugh and laugh hysterically like they were all kind of out of their mind. I never had that experience. I sat through it and watched it a lot. I was like the only guy that wasn't laughing. When the very first time I experienced this evangelist that came to our church, and I won't name him, you might have heard of him. It's not Benny Hinn. It's not that guy. <laughs> He's not that big. He's more of a middle-of-the-road kind of traveling evangelist. Uh, I will say he is from South Africa, but he's not that South African that uh, hangs around Trump. Okay, so um, it's a different one. But them two guys know each other. I don't think they're too fond of each other, actually. <laughs> that South African and the South African I'm talking about. But um, at any rate, the first time I sat through one of these, one of these uh, put the microphone in their face and they start laughing, spiritual laughter events, I guess, was under this guy's ministry the first time he came to our church. And I, at that point in my career, was desperately seeking God. I was desperately seeking God. And I had a lot of like personal uh, wounds that needed to be healed. And most of those had to do with the old Marine and my opinion of preachers in general and God in, in general and everything was kind of all muddied up with my opinion of the old Marine. And uh, so at any rate, um, during this spiritual breakout, I did have a spiritual experience of my own where I was just over away from everyone and everyone was laughing, but I was face down on the ground crying. <laughs> I was just weeping. And it was just more about me where I was at. And and uh, it kind of reminded me of the time after I'd been molested when I was a little kid and I, and I just couldn't wait for the church doors to open so I could just go up to the altar and cry. It was the one place where crying was acceptable, was in church. <laughs> you know, maybe that's it. I bet mean, it was also spiritual healing. You know, crying itself is healing but crying under the ministration of angels. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me as a child. You know, I wept and sought God and, and uh, ministers, angel, uh, angels ministered to my spirit. <clears throat> and that's what was happening to me the very first time I was at this guy's, one of this guy's events and everyone else was laughing, I was crying. And then later on, I would uh, try to engage in the, you know, later on when he would return back to our church and, and future services, I would try and, and engage in uh, <clears throat> in the laughter thing, you know, and I just didn't get it. Like, I didn't feel it. It was a little freaky to me. Honestly, hey, I'm not going to judge you if you've been to one of these services and you've engaged in it and you think it's of God. And I'm not judging whether it's of God or not. I'm just telling you my experience, what I did and didn't feel. And I felt just kind of, like, freaked out a little bit every time. I always, the laughing thing, it's, it felt a little bit like a spirit of ridicule, oddly. Even though nobody says anything, they're just all laughing. It's just like spontaneous laughter. Have you guys ever heard of this uh, <laughs> of this Pentecostal kind of phenomenon? 
you know, I, I've seen a lot of stuff growing up in a Pentecostal church and growing up charismatic and, you know, and everything. But to, you know, the, the laughing thing is way different. Anyway, I'm kind of off point here, but flash forward, I end up becoming a, an officer in that church and becoming a, a youth pastor in that church uh, that had invited this South African evangelist. And, um, and now you'll know why I'm not naming him because I'm about to throw him under the bus in a major way. <laughs> like I started out with this. This is, this guy really let me down. This guy really, this guy showed me his true colors. So, but you fast forward in time and now I've become a youth pastor. Not only that, I'm running a tri-state regional youth camp. Uh, 120, 130 kids. Not, not huge, but, but pretty big, from three different states, from Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. <clears throat> and uh, so we rent a campground in central Texas and uh, go down there to the hill country, um, kind of on the edge of the hill country in the Piney Woods. There's a camp, uh, kid campground down there. And I rented out a whole section of the place, and there were other camps going on at the time, but we had our, our section for our youth camp. And I was in charge of everything. I raised the funds for it. I did the advertising. I did the recruiting of the churches and all of the... I just set the whole thing up from ground zero. I started a year in advance planning the youth camps that I had there. It was always a year in advance. As soon as one ended, I was already planning the next youth camp. So, um, but when I haven't quite nailed down a speaker yet, the bishop comes to me and he says, Hey, man, I'm so excited. I got you a speaker for your youth camp. And I was kind of like, Oh, really? Oh, oh okay because uh, i mean typically i'd been the keynote speaker for the first couple and i had a uh, you know i'd chosen the last one before that and now this this guy chose one for me and so uh, anyway he says yeah it's so and so the south african guy you know him and i was like oh yeah not a right choice for a bunch of kind of scruffy wild teenagers you know i my ministry wasn't to the church kids my ministry was to the latchkey kids who's uh, parents left him home in the apartment complex all the time, <laughs> you know, and I thought well, that's gonna well, that's, we'll see how that works Well, maybe they'll all get laughing. That's all I could hope for, you know, <laughs> have a good laugh laugh time So anyway, um, you know, I plan the whole thing it comes out when I contact this minister's people About his need for accommodations. I'm told he won't be spending the night. He'll be coming He'll be doing the Friday evening service that's the biggest night of the of the week, the Friday evening service, and then he's going to uh, leave because he has another place he has to be in the morning. So they're going to drive to another town, get a hotel room on the way. So anyway, it's Texas hot, you know. It's so hot, even in the Piney Woods Hill Country, it's still hot, you know. And um, he arrives, and what I've done is I didn't have another room for him. I didn't give him a room because he wasn't staying, right? So I set up what we in the business call a green room. And I went to a lot of trouble. You know, I'm trying to run this big campground. I got, you know, 100 fires to put out. I got 20 volunteers helping me, 15 volunteers helping me. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> he arrives, and, and but before he arrives, I, I put together a green room, a receiving room for him, a place for him to chill out as best I can. And, um, you know, and I had to advance, in advance tell them, you know, what I wanted, which is basically a room that I could set up that had good air conditioning that... And close to a restroom. So I did. I got that all set up for him. Rented it, you know, with the campground. And um, now, let you know, nobody had their private room. I didn't have a private room. I stayed in a room full of uh, adult leaders, you know. And there was, no, actually, I think there were some seniors in there with us, too. So I was actually with students in the big dorm room that I stayed in. Nobody had individual cottages or bungalows. They weren't even available at this campground, right? I got him a conference room, made it into a green room close to a restroom that nobody used, but you'd just be there for him. And there was a shower if he needed it. And I provided him with things he needed, a basket that was full of snacks and different kinds of food. There was only one place to eat, and that is at the cafeteria with all of the other teenagers. So I took him out to dinner once he got there. And he seemed okay, you know, till I took him back and showed him the green room and everything and said goodbye to him. And then pretty soon my cell phone rings. And he, I'm in a harbor league around the corner, and he's just fighting mad. He's like, I just got to tell you, Sage, I've never, no one's ever treated me like this. No one's ever, this room you put me in is just absolute, it's just a, it's just, it don't, I don't even have my own shower. I don't even have my own restroom. I thought I would have a bed where I could take a nap. 
And I said, well, let, let me try and fix it. Let me, you know, I, I'm sorry. I just, I misunderstood you. And he's just dressing me down, right? And so I'm like, you know, hang on, let me, and I hang up my cell phone. I, I call the campground and there's not a bed available. Every, it's a, it's Friday of the, of one of the busiest weeks in summer before school starts back. And there's just not a room available, you know. And uh, I call him, I actually, I go back up, over there now. I'm, I'm off the phone, I'm over there, I'm face to face with him. And he's out on the, he's out on the balcony in front of the room I had for him. And he's just fuming, he's just mad, he's just angry. You know, and I mean, I, I made him a nice basket. There was an ice chest full of every kind of drink you could think of. From sodas to sparkling water to whatever. His, and then I had a basket full of everything that anybody might want. Like beef jerky and pepperoni sticks and, and candy and, you know, chips. And it was just a huge big basket that he could take on with him to his next deal. It was way more than any one person could eat. I figured him and his whole entourage would, could eat on it. And I, I and I like I said earlier before I took him back to his room, I took him to dinner. They got there at dinner time. And he only had an hour and a half or two hours before he was supposed to preach. You know? And uh so I I came back over there and I was like, Look, <laughs> I, there's not a room available. I don't even have a private room. You know, I'm running the show here. And he just said, I just want you to know, I just never been treated with so much disrespect. I mean, you just treat me like a, I'm like, this is some kind of, I'm in a cell here. I'm in a prison cell here. You know, I don't even have my own restroom. I don't even have a bed for me to lay down. And I was like, you want know, me to get you a cot? You know, hey, would you like to use my bed? <laughs> I'll, I'll change some sheets. I'll make, you know. And he was just like, no, nah, just, blah. and he wouldn't, and then he was just done. And he didn't want to talk to me, and I left him alone. And it came time for church, and he was supposed to preach. He knew when he was contracted to be there. He was paid in advance, right? And it was not a small amount. We paid him a large sum to be there. And he doesn't. He he's not there for for the beginning of the service. He's not there for praise and worship. And I'm about to go. Okay, well, I guess I am the keynote speaker. And you know, I mean, I can always talk about something. <laughs> so I thought, well, I guess I'm preaching. And I don't know, maybe we'll have to see whether he's going to refund us or what the fallout from this is going to be. And I'm thinking maybe I could get fired over this <laughs> ridiculousness. You know, I did... The guy that trained me how to treat foreign and, and out-of-town preachers was my boss, the bishop. He's the one that taught me how to make the green room and give him all the... And make up all the, the gift basket and everything they need and treat people so well. So I knew that I would have... Uh, everything I did was in line with what my boss wanted me to do. And... So anyway, but this guy doesn't show up. It's time to preach. And finally, the, door op the back door opens up and he decides to join us just in time to preach. He comes out. He swaggers around. He, he quotes a scripture. I don't even recall what it was. He says a few words. The whole thing is maybe seven minutes, six minutes. He's got the mic, right? And he never really said anything or made a point. He talked to the kids kind of like a stand-up comedian might right before he warms up to his jokes. And then he says a prayer. And hands the mic off to me and leaves out the same door he came in at. And a car was waiting for him out there. He gets in the car. Phew, he's gone. Well, I've spent a whole week building a spiritual message. I've spent a whole week with these teenagers shaping and building to this night. And this is what this guy delivers. He delivers six minutes of nothing. And we still got, I mean, I handed it off to him with a good hour to, to go, you know. So I took the mic, and I preached. And I got to say, whether you believe in the anointing or not, or whether it was just adrenaline or a little bit of anger fueling it, I believe it was the anointing. The anointing fell on me, and I delivered the best sermon of my life. The best sermon of my life. And the Spirit fell on that place. And those kids and the youth leaders and everybody, they, they, pray, they kept praying into the night long after I was well and completely exhausted and hosting a bonfire for the rest of the kids. There was still a revival meeting going on in that chapel. You know, God has a way of turning things around for people, you know. I mean, He wasn't going to leave those kids with that lackluster. I mean, I wasn't even so much mad at the guys. I was just disappointed in what he'd done to my youth camp by just not, just not delivering. But, you know, hey, <laughs> it probably turned out better than his little laugh fest could have turned out anyway. And I guess in the end, God always knows what he's doing. But I never seen somebody get so triggered and offended, and all I was doing the whole time was just trying to make him happy. And I thought I'd gone the extra mile. I thought I'd gone way, you know, gone above and beyond and done my job and, and fulfilled my duty, you know, and, and done right by him. 
And, um, yeah. So he tried to get me fired. And I had to deal, I had to deal with several phone calls with the bishop in an in-person meeting. And after hearing my side of the story, the bishop decided that that man would never step foot in our church again. And that he was going to quietly but firmly let everyone know who was associated with that individual what kind of person they were actually dealing with. Because we treated him right. And uh, I did the best I could. And I was so apologetic and never challenged him. I didn't even act frustrated. I wasn't upset with him, really. I was just trying to do my job as best I could until he handed that mic off to me. And I went, that's it. All of this. And that's what we get. And I hate to put a number to it, but when you pay, I'm just going to say it. When you pay somebody 1500 bucks for an hour of time, you expect to get the hour of time. So uh, we paid him. You know, he was paid in advance, you know. But uh, I don't know how much work he got around the people we knew after that. And he kind of disappeared, honestly, and probably rightfully so. I don't know if he was always black-hearted and corrupt and mean and ugly and hateful to people like that, or whether he grew into that, or whether he was just having a bad day. But I will, you tell, will tell you this, as far as I know, he never graced the pulpit in Parker County, Texas, ever again. All right, we'll see you next time.